over the next month or so, I want to start uh, showing some of the numbers that I've found over the past five to six months when training athletes and try to show which exercises seem to have the best correlation with improving uh, throwing velocity. Something I want to get across though is that these are indicators but not necessarily determinants of how hard you will throw a baseball. So by that I mean if you can throw a medicine ball extremely fast that does not necessarily mean you will throw a baseball at 90 miles per hour. Rather we are looking to see if you improve in your throwing velocity with a medicine ball it will likely correlate with an improvement in the ability to throw a baseball faster. So let's go through some of these things. Uh, with throwing obviously we're looking at five ounce throwing velocity as the main determinant. This is how hard you throw a baseball and if you're not testing a five ounce throwing velocity then obviously you are missing out on the actual test that matters. So you can test everything else here but this is what we are looking at to make sure that it's continuously improving. Um, now obviously there are going to be some athletes who cannot test five ounce throwing velocity year round. That's understandable as it's extremely stressful on the body to go through a full season of throwing a baseball, pitching and everything else and then in the off season if you're throwing full year round with that at high intensity you might run yourself into throwing problems and you also might miss out on training some of these other areas that are going to be very important for your overall development. So just understand what athletes you're working with, what schedules they uh, thrive in, and then how to make sure that you're marrying these sort of training philosophies and, and, and everything else that we do in the weight room and make sure that five ounce throwing velocity improves, not because we're forcing it to happen, but because all the training is culminating in improvement of five ounce throwing velocity. Moving on from that, you could test baseball throwing velocity in other ways. Obviously a run and gun pull down is a pretty good one. Kids really enjoy doing that. But the reality is that there are going to be some athletes who have great pull down numbers but really struggle with that five ounce baseball when it comes to their position or getting up on the mound. So you always want to make sure that they're not just good at pull downs, they're also transferring the run and guns to their, their actual mound. And, and position specific velocities. Long toss is another one where you see kids who can long toss the ball a mile. Um, you know, guys that can get it 320, 340 feet sometimes, but they can only throw 82 or 83 miles per hour on the mound. That's valuable information just because you know where the athlete's weakest and you know where they have to start targeting more in their training to start getting those downhill throws to start uh, getting better. Um, and then weighted ball throwing velocity is similar. I've seen some athletes who can throw a six ounce ball as hard as they can throw a five ounce ball. And there are some athletes who really do well with the lightweight balls, but don't do so well with the, the overload balls. So that's another way to test to see where the athlete struggles the most and where they might have to start targeting more in their, uh, in their training program. Uh, moving on from that, I found really good uh, medicine ball throwing velocity metrics to match up well with how hard they can throw a baseball. And this is pretty obvious because we're going through very similar planes of motion at similar speeds, similar contractile velocities in the exact same muscle groups that we will find when throwing a baseball. So something like a medicine ball overhead throw matches up really well with throwing velocity because it's going to take the ball through a big, big range of motion uh, requiring a lot of T-spine uh, thoracic spine extension and mobility there in the, in the shoulders similar to what we find when throwing a baseball and then we have the exact same muscle groups that are contracting super fast to get that ball uh, thrown as hard as possible so the two to four pound medicine ball is the best indicator of this specific power necessary to throw a baseball fast uh, medicine ball rotational throw velocity with a scoop toss or a shot put throw that seems to match up really well with swinging exit velocities actually but it, it matches up pretty well with throwing velocity with a baseball too i've also found medicine ball chest pass distance and uh velocity with that match up really well what's interesting here is uh, bench press did not seem to correlate really well with how far they could throw that three pound medicine ball in a chest pass and that's interesting because 
if my bench press is 300 pounds and I can only throw the three pound ball as far as I can 45 feet, but I have an athlete here who can only bench press 185, but they can launch that three pound ball 60 feet, I know that that athlete has a better capability to throw a five ounce baseball because they're able to produce force at higher speeds and that's what matters most. Can you produce force in a very small window with the muscle groups involved with throwing a baseball? And, and, and that's why medicine ball uh, throwing velocity and distance seems to match up so well with baseball throwing velocity. Supine throw velocity is another one. I've been using that for force velocity profiling for a while. It's a really good exercise and, and it's really a good way to get reliable readings on guys because it's such a short uh, range of motion, they really can't cheat it with any other uh, muscle groups involved with the legs or anything like that that can boost their numbers. Um, so what I like to think about here is as we go down the pyramid, if you improve in one of these metrics, it more directly improves everything above it. It expands the pyramid here. Whereas as we go down, we could expand the pyramid here but it seems to have less and less and less correlation with improving everything above it. Now it's important to build that base up of the pyramid very well, but what's most important is to make sure that these are always improving. These very specific power metrics that we find with baseball throwing are always improving as a result of everything that we do down here. So moving on from that, 10 yard dash sprint speed, depth jump RSI, these are good indicators of how well the athlete can produce force at high speeds in the lower body and how springy that lower body really is. How much stiffness do they have in that lower body? And that's important because the front leg brace, that planting leg, does have to produce a lot of force into the ground and then transfer it up the chain super fast. And if you lack that stiffness in the knee and in the surrounding muscle groups, you're not going to be able to transfer energy very well because you're going to find that knee starts collapsing forward too much. That front leg bracing action just doesn't happen. Those athletes who are really good in this area are probably really good at that front leg bracing action. Uh, shoulder external rotation strength. I've been tracking this with a crane scale. It's not a great correlation of how hard you can throw, but it does seem to be a great correlation of how fatigued your rear shoulder muscles are and how good of an ability you might have to decelerate. So if you're an athlete who throws a baseball pretty fast in the 90 mile per hour range, but your shoulder external rotation strength is pretty low, say um, if you were to do a strict test pulling in this action and you can only get 15 pounds of force, then that's your weak point and you know that you have to improve that rear shoulder eccentric strength and that overall rear shoulder strength in order to improve that ability to decelerate. So this is kind of like showing your weakness here. Um, and then plyo push-up height. The problem that I find with these three is that they are dependent on body weight in order to be good at the exercise. So what I always tell guys is, don't focus so much on what your number is, focus more on improving your number in each exercise. You can track plyo push-up height with a G-Flight from x Surgio Technologies. Moving on from that, um, I like tracking bar speed with a lot of movements, so how fast can you move in a deadlift and how fast you can move in a bench press. Uh, is a really good indicator of the power that we want to see happen in the weight room and it's a great way to get the intent higher when guys are lifting weights instead of just lifting slow and with low intent they're starting to move the bar with actual intensity that's what we want to see to make sure that all the training they do in the weight room starts to help with aiding in maximal force production that we will find show up out on the field um, but again, it's not a great correlation. We just want to make sure that the strength training we do in the weight room ultimately culminates in improvements in bar speeds. One arm row, five rep max, similar to shoulder external rotation strength. If you have a guy who can throw extremely fast but really struggles with rowing, they're probably going to be somebody who needs to improve that rear shoulder strength. So it's, it's a good correlation, but only with the ones who really are, are struggling in that area. Um, vertical jump height is 
okay. They actually, the top three throwers that I train only have about a 20 to 24 inch vertical on the G flights that we've been tracking. Um, some athletes are better at it, some athletes aren't. Again, it's kind of dependent on body weight, which if you're a lower body weight, you're probably gonna have a better vertical jump, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna throw a baseball faster. Uh, overcoming pal-off hold. This is one I've been tracking with the crane scale where the crane scale would be attached to an immovable object over there and we'd be pulling on the crane scale here right out in front of the chest with feet roughly uh, about shoulder width apart, just pulling as hard as you possibly could. That's an interesting one because I thought it was gonna have better correlation than it does. Uh, the reality is that if you could get above 45 pounds of force, um, you're probably in a pretty good spot where your core muscles are no longer very weak um, and, and you're able to produce enough force in the trunk to be able to actually throw a baseball fast. But getting more than say 60 pounds of force produced in that pal off hold doesn't really seem to have great correlation with improving your overall throwing velocities. And then moving on from that, do we have your big deadlift, your, your reverse lunge, and your bench press one rep max? I'm not a big one rep max fan. The problem with one rep max is, is that technique can start to go out the window um, and we begin sacrificing bar speed. The reality is that when you're training, you should always continuously see improvements in the one rep max as a result of everything you do in the training, but we shouldn't be testing the one rep max on a consistent basis. Rather, what you should be doing is moving a pretty heavy weight with those athletes who are force deficient, moving a pretty heavy weight at high intensities for sets of two, sets of three, making sure that there is no velocity loss per set. And if we're continuously shooting for a one rep max, all you're going to be doing is maximizing motor unit recruitment for one rep, and then you're gassed for the rest of the workout. So make sure that you're training smart and not consistently trying to test in these areas. Um, and the reality is, like I talked about before, there's simply not a great correlation between these big metrics and how hard you can throw. And by that I mean, yes, athletes who can reverse lunge 135 only are probably not gonna have a great ability to throw a baseball super fast, but you're gonna find guys who throw really fast and can only reverse lunge 135. So. By and large, most athletes who throw fast can also reverse lunge pretty well. They can probably reverse lunge their body weight for a set of five, no problem. But beyond that, I don't really know if there's a huge correlation with improving in the reverse lunge and seeing huge jumps in the baseball throwing velocity. Grip strength is another one. I have some athletes who can grip strength uh, 160 pounds and they throw really hard. And I have some guys who can only grip strength 90 pounds and they throw really hard too. Uh, but one thing I like tracking with this is making sure that athlete's grip strength is not going down. If it's going down, then that could be an indicator of fatigue, whether that be peripherally or central nervous system fatigue. And if that's the case, then no longer are you gonna be working at maximal capacity when you're doing all these other movements. So if you track grip strength on a consistent basis, you should begin to find that there are gonna be days when you should push the athlete harder with a more intense training session and days where you should reel them back and, and have them go through a low intensity training session. And then lastly, these movements I found that testing in these areas really aren't necessary for a training program, even with a velocity or force deficient individual. If you have somebody who's super force deficient, you probably don't need to do a whole ton of back squatting or bench press at high reps. If you have a velocity deficient individual, you don't have to do a whole lot of Olympic lifting. You could do it if you like. Some people see great results, but the reality is that I don't do really any of these. I don't test back squat run, one rep max. I don't do Olympic lifting, and I don't do a bench press reps test. There's just simply not a great correlation between that and the specific power necessary between force production and high velocity strength that is going to correlate to throwing a five ounce baseball fastest. So I think you could probably stick mostly in this realm with those force deficient individuals, obviously focus on improving this. And then if you have a more velocity deficient individual, more of your training can focus in this area and in this area, and that should ultimately transfer very well 
to throwing a baseball fast.